the audience I was serving were people who wanted to write their own books. What I realized in 2018 is that the audience that I want to serve are the people who, re- who don't have the time to write their own books. And so we write it for them. Now, there are a couple of messages in what Mitchell just said. First message is, and, and part of what he does, <laughs> his company is called Aha That. And you can hear he had an aha moment in 2018 when he realized he was writing books for the wrong audience. The second message, therefore, is knowing who your audience is. And we all make the same mistakes, choosing or believing that we know who our audience is. And very often they are not the people that we're targeting. It's, it's the biggest mistake I see people make in business. And I, I've witnessed this about myself too, by the way. So I'm just as guilty. And sometimes you just find out by trial and error, you don't even know, or or as they say, you don't know what you don't know, literally, when you start out in business. So um, speaking to Mitchell has been really incredible for me because I learned loads from him. And But what he does, to me, sounds so unique as well, and something that all of you that are in business or want to get in business can learn from. Um, So super interesting interview. He's been in Silicon Valley for 30 years. Wow. What changes has he seen in that time? Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Mitchell. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Thank you for it's it's early in the morning for you. It's evening for me. Uh, you're the other side of the world almost. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so thank you so much for taking the time. I'm really interested um, and excited to hear your story. So my first question I ask all my guests is to share a little bit about your personal life. So where were you born? Uh, did you move around? Did you stay in one place? But, you know, a bit about your education, your family, if you want to, where you now live and where you've ended up. Uh, and then we'll take it from there. So over to you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that was about eight questions. Okay. Yeah, I know. So <laughs> no, no problem. It, it leaves it really open ended. So uh, I, I uh, w- was born uh, in the United States on the East Coast. So there's there's clearly a differentiation between people who were born on the East Coast and West Coast. Yes. We're a lot more straightforward, a lot more gung-ho, a lot more in your face. Mm. So born on the East Coast, uh, moved around a lot. I grew up uh, actually below the poverty line. Uh, single mom with three kids mm-hmm. uh, who was a school teacher who, who, even with all that, still went back, got increased her education and we uh, we felt uh, us kids. We we never felt like we we were missing or lacking anything. So oh, bless her. As She's long as yeah, an What's amazing that? lady, an amazing lady. Oh, absolutely. As long as you feel there's love, right? It it kind of works. I think. I think the interesting part is uh, we we ate the type of meals that y- you don't really want to serve. You mm. know, <laughs> and you know, like I can't remember. It's something like. Every Wednesday night was hot dog night or every Thursday was sloppy Joe. And it was kind of nice to be consistent and had something you like. Right. And, yeah. And it's, I, you know, as a kid, you don't realize that, you know, mom's just making it by. But it's really uh, the biggest thing she left all of us is simply, hey, you could do whatever you want. You've got what you need. You could do whatever you want and never, never put the types of doubts in us that potentially some some parents and some people do it just simply go go for it wow the, what a uh, gift that's an, uh, an incredible gift and i'm sure that will come out in your story as well so yeah keep going oh i don't know i i, I will if you wanted to but yes that was a beautiful gift um <laughs> <laughs> uh i uh 
I went to undergrad at the University of Miami and then went to uh, uh, got my MBA at the College of William and Mary in uh, Williamsburg, Virginia. University of Miami is in Florida. Right. And then uh, after that, I, I what typically my my work and where I landed, I always think about the the word I like to use is a serendipity. Mm. Um, some opportunity just opened itself up and that's how I got to the, the place I was. So in, uh, MBA school, I took on a special project with a finance teacher. Um, I proved a theory that he wanted to prove to actually take to wall street. Uh, he, uh, two weeks after I shared it with him, he, uh, I, I go into his office said, Hey, I started writing the paper. This is pretty cool stuff. Uh, you know, how do we go about publishing it? And his response was, oh, you're not going to publish it. I got a job in a, an investment bank in, in Boston, and uh, you're going to come with me. Mm. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's how I got to Boston. And, and three years later, I, had, uh, I, met, I, met, uh, I met a girl that I thought was pretty amazing. And she ended up moving out to California, which at the time is where my parents lived. Uh, six months later, I followed her, and and close to uh, thirty years later, we've been married. So, wow. uh, serendipity just always presented itself in unique and interesting ways. So, I currently live in Silicon Valley. Been here a little over thirty years, and I've been fortunate enough to watch the tremendous the co- the continued proliferation of what technology has done to the world, and yeah. to be at the epicenter of the companies and the individuals that are making stuff happen. Wow, that's that's incredible. 30 years in Silicon Valley to have seen and witnessed all of that explosion. Uh, can I say see, witness, and participate and yeah. drive? <laughs> okay, yeah. see, witness, participate, drive. <laughs> oh, God. That's incredible. That's, yeah, that's, have you written a book about it? <laughs> Well, well, so here's, so by the way, that's a beautiful question as a publisher, right? Yeah. So as a publisher, we've published over 800 books. Mm. Um, I personally have written 62. Wow. So here's, here's something to think about. This is really interesting. So let's say, uh, let's say you, which by the way, do, do you do any cooking whatsoever? Yeah, a little bit. All right. What's your favorite dish that you cook? Oh God! What well, that's a difficult question. Actually, I just I just prepared something uh, that's going to be ready for my. We we're literally having some roasted vegetables with uh, quinoa. Got it. So let's say that you have company come over, and they look at you and they go, "Oh my God, these are the best roasted vegetables I have ever had in my life." You need to open up a restaurant. Yeah. Do you yeah. actually open up a restaurant? Who, me? And, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, a- actually, most people, the answer should be no way. No so, way. Yes. So you said to me, hey, Mitchell, that's a great story. Did you write a book? Mm. And and the answer is, well, you know, you don't, in today's world, you don't write a book because you have an interesting story. Mm. You write a book because that book is an asset. And that asset is a tool that you use to drive more business. Mm. So if the book that I told my story would get more people to want to, to write books, i.e. the business that I run, and to close more business, then I would write it. But I don't see that in that book of my story, right? Mm. So uh, what happens today, or what I think is exciting, is this concept called a book is still the quintessential element of respect that we give people in the world. I mean, even as easy it is to create a book, even as as straightforward it is, uh, since the time of the Bible, and certainly since the proliferation, since the Gutenberg press, we we have looked at these books and the authors of the book, book with such high esteem. And so what I have done is I've allowed people to press the easy button. So the question I always ask is, what is what is your business, right? So, so, so for those that are listening, here's the thing to think about. What is your business? And more importantly, 
who are your customers? Obviously, we don't na- need names. It, and and what by I'm saying that is, what is the pain point? What is the issue they're coming to you with? So in, in Silicon Valley speak is, what's their pain and how do you solve it? Yeah. So for me, I call that the CPOP. What is your customer's point of pain? Right. So if you look me in the eyes, I'm going to say, hey, what's your CPOP? And uh, I don't know, you want, do you want to take a stab at your CPOP? I'm just curious. My CPOP. Yeah, for your business, Michael, what's your CPOP? Mm, point of pain. It's probably always has been getting clients that stay with you, right? So what I mean with that, they come to me with one-off projects, but they don't stay for long enough. Uh, they just use me for one project and they're off somewhere else doing something. Ah, oh, well, that's so that's your point of pain. So if yeah. I said, what's my CPOP and you are my client, I would say I have a, a guy named Michael who, Michael DeGroote, who, who actually his clients come from one, they, they come and go. Yeah. Right. But when your clients come to you for that first engagement, what is it that they want you to solve for them? Oh, for them. Okay. So they, it depends because I'll just qualify it just very slightly by saying that their initial thought process is that they come to me to just create a video animation, right? Because right. they want something different to get their message out in front of their clients. But, or and, they don't know how to deliver, often how to deliver the message. They kind of go, oh, I just want to create an advert. And I said, well, do you really want to create an advert or do you want to share a story with your client? Which <laughs> actually conveys exactly what we're just talking about. What is their point of pain and how are you going to solve it? So let's create a story with a character in it so that when they see that video, they go, that's me. I've got that exact same problem. And then you illustrate or you show them how you solve that problem. So you create a story rather than just an advert. I know there are adverts out there that are good stories too. I'm not saying they're not, but often people just go, oh, I just want to promote my services. You know, just create a video to say, here's my product and buy me. I said, well, that's okay, but that's not going to be that successful in Got business it. to business. It's more about, you know, what's... The, you know, how can you convey your value proposition through a story? So often they come with, I have a problem, I want to just convey my product and service, but they come away with me converting them into developing a story, <laughs> which is exactly the thing that you're talking about. Oh, no, I, I love what I love what you're saying, right? Because it's uh, and, and I'm actually let's see, I I because I didn't have enough time to write it down and think it through, let me give you a title of a book that's way too long for a title, mm-hmm. right? So you could start off now. So, so just imagine, because by the way, we don't, you don't need a title that's like, like one or two words. We don't, it's not, you're not going to create a book that's going to sell like hotcakes. You're going to have an asset, right? For you personally, right? You're going to have an asset that you could hand to somebody and it, could help them get over that first half hour you're, when you're, where you're trying to convince them that, by the way, it's not an advertisement that it's one and done. It's a story where you're engaging your prospect to want to I- interact with you, mm. right? Mm. So it could be something like you start with an open-ended question. Some people don't like to do this is want to advertise on the internet. Yes. And then the next thing is your ad should be a story that engages. Mm. And your engagement should continue to evolve. Mm. So I know that's long for a title. We could probably shorten it. Mm. But but what happens is, so I'm just giving this to you as an example. Yeah, great. What what you want to think about is, imagine if you had a Amazon best selling book. Somebody comes to you, or they even they get close to your website, or they see the ad and they say, "Want to advertise on the internet?" or "Want successful ads on the internet?" They're like. And, and, they, and they go, yes, and they keep reading, your ad should be a story, and your story should engage and, e- and e- evolve over time, hmm. right? All of yes. a sudden, 
they're like, that's interesting. And by the way, the engage is what you talk about today. How you get your clients to come back, Michael, is you convince them that their story needs to evolve over time. Yes. Right? Because then what happens, because you shouldn't be selling, if I'm thinking about you, you shouldn't be selling a one and done. You should be selling a annual subscription where you automatically update the story over time, whether it's, you know, you do it ma- annually or ha- uh, semi-annually or quarterly. Mm. Right. Where where so instead of the, you know, you charge a higher price for one off, you try charge a much lower price, but have monthly recurring revenues or quarterly revenue where you're just continually updating. Yeah. I and, love and that wait. as an idea. Yeah. That's, that's oh, great. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> oh, you're absolutely welcome. And what happens is how you communicate your message. And this is what I talk about in the book is we come up with a title that when somebody reads that by itself, they go, yeah, you know, the last time I did my ads it, it and spent money, I just didn't get the right ROI. Maybe I do need to create a story that's engaging. And maybe I need to create engagement that changes over time. Maybe I need to talk to Michael. Got you. <laughs> so that's what, so, so, so thanks for getting me off on that by saying I should write a book on my story. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> The, if I wrote a book on my story on how I've helped people see their world in a different way, mm. then technically I've kind of done that in a couple of my books. Like the book I did right now complements the TED talk I did. Yes. And, and the book is called Being Seen and Being Heard as a Thought Leader. Yes. Right. So for me, it's 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 still relatively short title. I could probably add to that and my subtitle adds more. and. And the thing is, if you're like, oh, I want to be seen and be heard as a thought leader, maybe I need to talk to Mitchell, right? That To me, that's what a book does, is it gives you that credibility because you've spent the time and you've spent the energy to address the specific pain point that the prospects that are coming to you, that they really have, not necessarily in your case, they're coming to you with a very specific, hey, listen, you're, you're a, a once and done guy, give me give me a give me an ad that i can use and you're spending the time and energy to show them they need something more you just need the hook for them to come back yeah 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 got it got it okay so that's that's we, we did go off a bit there because because <laughs> of the point that made 30 years in silicon valley wow that's incredible <laughs> um so when you so let's go back to when you moved there to follow your sweetheart who was who was in California. What what did you then do going from east to west coast? Change of culture and all that. What what was the first thing you went to do there? Oh, so uh, nice question. I think I, I've done 150 shows this year. Nobody's asked me that question. So, um, <laughs> so. <laughs> So this is going to be the show that says, hey, let's ask stuff that nobody else did. So yeah, I'm going to try. I, I, you know, I'm, I, at the time I was in Boston uh, and uh, East Coast, East Coast essentially means uh, at the time you dressed up all the time. You, you know, you wore your shoes, you wore your three piece suit or your two piece suit. Uh, if you ever said something th- like if I ever said to my boss, you know, I don't think I want to be working in a bank. I was doing uh, systems for a bank. I don't think I want to be in a bank the rest of my life. I would have been a fire the next day. I mean, that that's type of culture. And what happened is I, I once I started thinking I needed to go to California, I, I was silly enough, particularly in Silicon Valley, to think that, God, all companies in Silicon Valley, those streets are paved with gold. I'm going to get rich. So let's just find a startup company. Yes. So, so I found a startup company working in San Francisco. It turns out the uh, the person who was my boss we're still friends today. And the thing is, I I went out there and uh, I I I really enjoyed that. And I'll do the and. Mm -hmm. If you think about business models, they had three fundamental tenets to their business model. And when I looked at it after the fact, two of the two of the three were just floored. Right. So, so by definition, not all. So I was there for, I was there for a year before 
before they went under. Right. And uh, and then and then so so by the way so as an entrepreneur we have to realize it's always good to break outside the box. But if you have three fundamental tenets, you could have one of them to be flawed and then change it over time. But you can't have two. No. <laughs> you know to be bad. So. So what happened is I actually took advice from my parents after that because I, I was first a little shocked that not all Silicon Valley companies <laughs> uh, don't make it. And uh, there, there was and no gold. Said, <laughs> yeah, there was no gold in that there. You know, and, and, and they go, uh, they, go uh, they said to me, Mitchell, why don't, why don't you go to a large company with a good brand? You know, because then what you can do, you could be there for a couple of years, you could meet lots of people and you could navigate within the within the organization uh, to different roles and take it from there. And and I, you know, it just I couldn't I couldn't flaw that logic. So I went to Sun Microsystems right. and, and I worked for Sun for nine years. And I ultimately when I left uh, before I became uh, uh, started my entrepreneurial endeavors, I became the. Uh, I was running the e-commerce component of Sun Supply Chain, which at the time was three and a half billion. Wow. And and so I left in in 1997, which was the sort of the oh, oh, about the start of the dot com days. About a, about I don't know about a half year into it, and and it just it was the time when things were taking off like wildfire. And being in Silicon Valley during the dot com days was. Just a beautiful entrepreneurial endeavor for me, and I I, I did a ton of different companies and different activities. It, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Wow. So so w there was only one company then that kind of failed quite quickly, and then you went to Sun Microsystems and stayed for such a long time. So what was the catalyst then over those nine years then to, you know, to go on your own. Did you then start on your own after those nine years? So, uh, yes, I started on my own after that. And what the callus was somewhere around 1996, I was, uh, I had taken on the, it, what, what ended up happening, which was fun is the VP of operations for sun had four different divisions uh, that, or four different departments that were doing some form of e-commerce. Uh, my uh, my brand was starting to get out there as something that I would do. He asked me to come over and work at his firm, and he said, "Mitchell, I'm sorry, his division." He goes, "Mitchell, I, uh, I, I," and this was this was the straightforward answer. He goes, this is thing called e-commerce. I'm not sure what it is. I've got four departments doing it. Could you come in, tell me what I should do, come up with a plan for the division and how much money you need to make it happen? Right. So so it, you could almost say that that within a company, I had my first entrepreneurial effort. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and sometime in there, I went I went to uh I went to the one of the guys I was working for underneath him. Is that true? Yeah. Okay. And uh, and he gave me some advice. So I went to somebody as a mentor and said, and, and and my answer was, I'm not sure I want to do this the rest of my life. How do I, how do I go and do something else? And the something else was I wanted to be part of the management team of a successful company, right? right? Which is what I was looking at because I. You know, I looked at some of the decisions that Scott McNeely, the CEO, was making. I didn't like them. And I'm like, I could do better. So I just wanted to be part of a management team. Right. And uh, and so he gave me a framework, a way to think about the world in a different way. And and so at that stage, it was I think it was 1997. I kind of knew I was going to go. No, no, I'm sorry. 1990. Oh, sorry. Take that back. 1995. I kind of know I was going to go. and. Uh, and I ended up, I ended up spending another couple of years because there were a couple of things on my roadmap that I needed to fill in that I just didn't have at the time. Right. And so it was, it was, it was really you know getting the outside network, doing more favors for people in the outside world, giving basically giving more of myself and being part. One of the things that that he suggested is is. Uh, participate in a nonprofit and make stuff happen there. And so what was fascinating is uh, I started doing those sort of things. And, and because Sun Microsystem was the company that was behind lots of the internet, 
uh, one of the things that happened is I joined a nonprofit uh, as uh, it was a company called CommerceNet. Sun was paying money to CommerceNet to be part of the membership. But even though the marketing department was doing that, they didn't really want any, they didn't want to do anything with, with the nonprofit. They just paid the money and, and did their job. Right. So I offic- I quickly became the official spokesperson to Commerce Not. And and when AC Nielsen did their first study that there were 50, I think it was 50 million people using the internet, um, which was huge at the time, <laughs> when the newspapers were looking for somebody to talk to, I became a spokesperson. So I was right. quoted in the news and all that. And And then when we were running a conference, um, I I had a pretty uh, interesting uh, desire to to focus on the marketing side, and so I was asked to find a couple spe- people who could speak at the conference that uh, CommerceNet was running. So I reached out to this firm. They I think they had they just got either Series A. No, I think it might have been Series B funding. Uh, it was in it was in 1996. And uh, it was somebody who just seemed like he was going to change the world and do something interesting. So many people said, oh, my God, this is not going to work. And I kind of liked it. So I asked Jeff Bezos <laughs> if he would come and speak at the conference. Wow. And and he said yes. <laughs> and, you know, the really interesting part is now this is before Amazon went public. So there was always a question of whether or not this this company would ever do anything. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and. And so he's sitting, you know, before the talk, he's sitting outside on a bench. Nobody is around him. So I sat down next to him. We talked for about 20, 25 minutes, you know, and, and it was just, it was fun to hear his vision without being under the camera, you know, without yes. being in front of the press. And, yes. you know, he didn't say the word AWS, but he, he basically said, listen, I, I'm, I'm starting here. And what's going to happen is as we solve this solution, I'm going to bump into other things that the world needs and we'll just productize it and sell them. Mm. (laughs) And so he did. (laughs) Whoa. So, but I think, did did I answer your question? I I, I might've went off a little bit, but I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) That's okay. I I loved it. So the question was, then what was the catalyst um, that got you doing your own thing? Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Sorry. <laughs> that was meandering in my own story. How silly me. Um, you know, it was I, I, when the my mentor basically had me focus on what my goal was, where yeah. I wanted to go. And, and as I did mention, and I wanted to be yeah. – Part of the management team of a successful company. I kind of thought that meant I was going to start a company just like Sun or be part of a company just like Sun. Mm. I hadn't realized that I could start my own company. I mean, I just hadn't really thought about it. And and one day, as as I'm getting all these inquiries from the press, and I see how much excitement is going on in Silicon Valley, I go, you know, I should just start a management consulting company helping people on uh, e-commerce. Right. And so, uh, so I did. <laughs> and, you know, and you what imagine was that the conversation, I come home to my wife, she's, I think at the time she was pregnant and, and I said, honey, I just can't, I can't wait anymore. I, I have to start a company. I have to do this. Mm. Her, her one question to me was, um, uh, will we be able to afford health insurance? Cause you know, I'm pregnant. <laughs> I said yes, <laughs> and uh, and I put up the shingle that said, "Hey, I'm I'm uh, doing a consulting company, and and I'm doing management consulting, and and uh, I had already built a good network, so I started walking around my network you know, virtually, obviously, and 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 asking people what they had, and it turns out the my first client was uh, somebody I worked for at Sun. And he was running a, a, a web development company. And I said, hey, hey, Rick, I'm doing management consulting, helping companies understand, you know, uh, e-commerce. You got anything for me? He goes, well, not exactly like that, Mitchell. He goes, but do you know anything about SEL? And, you know, so, so Michael, here's the thing that's interesting. You know, entrepreneur, want to start my own company. First person who sort of said, I got something. And it is the opposite end of what I was thinking about. 
Mm. Right. So so you think about strategic consulting, focus on thought leadership at the high end. I think about something as mundane as SEO on the low end. And here's where an entrepreneur kicks in. Uh, somebody who's not an entrepreneur says, nope, I don't know anything. Uh, and it's too low level for me. Yeah. Somebody who's an entrepreneur says, you know, and his name was Rick. I go, Rick, I don't know anything about SEO, but let me learn everything I can and I'll get back to you. <laughs> so. So, by the way, in, in 1997, it was not that hard to learn everything you can about SEO. So I spent two weeks. I bought everything on the market. I came back to him and I said, uh, why don't we charge your clients $15,000 and you pay me 10? <laughs> he goes, okay, we sold five. <laughs> now, here's where the present came in. So first, starting a company making 50000 you know, that, that's a present. That's not bad. But here's where the real present came in. To do SEO, what you want to do is ask your prospect, give me your 30-second elevator pitch. And after 30 seconds, you're listening to key phrases that are used consistently. And anything that's used two or three times, you want to make a separate web page focused on that term. And that's how you could, you could show the search engines that you were serious about that type of uh, activity in your business. Sure. So – I asked all five, and typically I was de dealing with either the CEO or the CMO, and I asked all five that question, and all five took 10 minutes to respond. And I'm thinking, you know, I think I have some strategy consulting opportunity. Two of them became clients. Right. <clears throat> right. So the present, as an entrepreneur, the present is always there, and you don't want to throw it out before you explore everything you can. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so therefore, I mean, th this is so interesting because as an aunt, as a bit, let's call it something slightly different as a business person, when people go into business, they're going to go, okay, what's my product? What's my service? Now I've got to go out and sell that. What you just described was what's the problem? What's the question? <laughs> How can I deliver that? Uh, how can I serve this person with this? Or how can I make it happen? And that's that's a really fascinating concept because we, as a business person, you always feel you need to have all the, you know, you ha need to have all the training and all the answers and all the solutions rather than just say, yes, I can do that and go and find out how you can do it. Well, I think I think one of the things, for those that are interested and you want to learn more about me, I, I actually did a, a TED Talk that you can get to. Just type Mitchell Levy TED Talk and you'll see it. And one of the things I talk about is that the fundamental tenet, here's, here, I'll give you the, uh, the, the cliff notes. Yeah. Uh, we do business with those that we know, like, and trust. Yeah. So it turns out, that it, this is somebody who knows me, uh, and this is somebody who both liked me and trusted me. Yes. So I was able to say, "Hey, Rick, I, let me let me research and find out everything I can." And given that he knew my doggedness and tenacity to do that type of research, he's like, "Okay, <laughs> mm -hmm. right?" Because he knew he was going to be hiring an expert, and that he would be putting his clients in good hands. Yeah. Right. So what in that particular case, so for instance, Michael, you're the same thing. A client comes to you for a particular thing they want to get done. You you help them understand what they're really getting. What what you need to do as a follow up is you need to figure out how to continually put them on a recurring revenue basis versus just that one off. Yeah. You've helped them see the world in a different way. And now you need to figure out how, how you could continually serve them the type of food and education that will, it, it, and essentially it comes down to how you could help them to continue to make money by attracting new clients and get paid for it. Mm. Fascinating. Okay, so you were off helping lots of companies with e-commerce, SEO, getting online, that type of thing. Is that right? Uh, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> sort of, right. We're so what was, the story. what was your company called when you, when you put it together? 
Oh, you know, this is one of those things I knew was silly as soon as I put it together. I knew I had a 10-year life of the company, and I said at the time, uh, I, don't, I don't care. Um, I called it ECNOW, E-C-N-O-W.com. Right. Okay. Or e-commerce now. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that happened is uh, uh, IBM spent a billion dollars building the brand e-business. Mm. And e-commerce became more of a technical thing versus a business thing. I'm like, oh, that's too bad. Right. Um, so what ended up happening, a, a bunch of different things. So one, before I even started my business, as I'm talking to people, uh, one of my friends said to me, hey, Mitchell, if you want to be in business, you need to do one of three things. Uh, you need to teach. You need to write a book. You need to speak at events. Right. Um, so I decided to do uh, all three. And one of the things I was doing at the time was teaching at San Jose State University in their professional development program. Yeah. So I think my first year out, uh, I started to get so busy that – and San Jose Professional Ed was paying a good, good amount of money. Right. Um, but I started getting so busy that it I couldn't afford to be there anymore time-wise. Mm. And here's another thing about me. I, I never actually quit. What I often say to people is, can I do more or, or I'll need to do less? Right. Right? Because it, it basically, you, whenever you interact with somebody, you want to present an opportunity where they're not narrowed in to giving you a specific answer because they may surprise you. Yeah. So it was the, the dean of the university, and they said, Mitchell, you ever think about running a program for us? And I go, no, never did. I And once again, I said, well, give me three weeks. Let me think about it. I'll come back to you. So I, I gave it some thought, and I came back and said, let me create a program. This is this was – I think we started it in 19 – I think it was 1998 or, or 9. I got to put, put my fingers on that. It might have been 1999. But I, I basically said – right, yeah, it was 1999. We started. I said, why don't we do this? Um, I'm going to run a program for you. We're going to start it nine months from now. Uh, I wanted to start it in the fall area. I'm going to start it off. We're going to start off with 30 classes. Here's our price points. Here's what we're going to charge. Here's what a certificate's about. Basically crafted the whole thing. And then I said words that made them laugh. I said, I don't want you to pay me to do all of this upfront work. I just want 25% of the door. Now, nobody had ever come to them before and been successful at creating a uh, a online certificate, I mean, a, a certificate program like this. Yeah. And uh, so they laughed at me, thought I was being really stupid, and quickly signed the contract and said yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we sold over 4,700 courses, took in over $2 million of revenue. And, uh, and, and now here's where universities are in, in, inevitably not very smart. They were unhappy paying me. They didn't, you know, they, they don't look at that and go, oh, my God, I have one point five million dollars we, we wouldn't have had without Mitchell. Mm -hmm. All they think about is, man, I got to pay. I got to pay this guy a half million dollars. Yeah. Right. So anyhow, it's it, uh, academic institutions are typically not entrepreneurial in nature. No. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's uh, I don't mind uh, putting in the type of work. And if we succeed, we make good money. But we should. You should never, if somebody helps you make money, you should never at some point in time go, I don't want to pay you anymore for what you've helped me create. It just doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't seem smart. No, no, absolutely. Uh, okay. So, uh, oh, just as a quick little aside, because I was doing that, I also got asked by the largest conference company in the world to, uh, to run an e-commerce conference for them. So that was mm. Comdex. Comdex was on par with CES at the time and, and they asked whether or not I could run run a conference. So I ended up running four conferences for Comdex. Whoa! And then, uh, and then to fast forward somewhere in there, a friend of mine I had been giving advice to said, "Hey, Mitchell, you've been acting kind of like a board member for for a couple of years now. I'm a big fan of of giving." Um, and so he goes, "Hey, how'd you like to join my board?" So then I became uh, I, I became uh, part of a board of a publicly traded company and did that for nine years as well. Wow. Okay. So let's let's fast forward a little bit. You were doing so many things, and you know when I've looked at your LinkedIn, I'm like, oh my god, he's done all this stuff. We'll we'll never have enough time. <laughs> so let's let's fast forward 
to kind of current day and why or can you share with us a little bit about what the essence is of what you do today and how you you know help people achieve more because i know there's like thought leader mentor entrepreneur all in that but what's what's the essence of it yeah it's you know it's as a so i affectionately call myself a parallel entrepreneur versus serial right i i you, I want to have a couple eggs in in a number of different baskets. Right. And uh, however, when when I'm on a, a show like this or when I'm in public talking, people like to see that you do a single thing. So let me tell you what I do. Mm. I empower experts, thought leaders, and companies to share their genius. Mm. And and even if you think about the when we're talking about your business and where you are and how you present yourself, just the 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 less than five minutes that you and I were talking about you, that's what I do. Mm. And our go-to-market strategy at the moment is, and this has been something I've been doing since 2018. So I've been a publisher from 2005 to 2018. Mm. Between 2005 and 2017, we've published over 800 books. Mm. And what I could say to you is between that time frame, I was serving the wrong audience. Right. <laughs> The audience I was serving were people who wanted to write their own books. What I realized in 2018 is that the audience that I want to serve are the people who, who don't have the time to write their own books. And so we write it for them. Wow. And so that's, that's what we do today. And, and the strategy and, and is, is really simple. If you want to demonstrate that you're an expert in your space, you should have a book. The title, by the way, Michael, you're going to know this. Uh, th what's the title of your book? It's it's your CPOP. <laughs> it's right. your customer's point of pain. Yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so what I do is I'll do a two-hour interview and I'll extract the genius from your head. And, and what am I doing? I'm actually listening to you. Uh, what's, what's the problem your clients have? What so, sort of things manifest when they're thinking about it? Why do they have reservations in hiring you? What do you do to be successful? What do other people do to be successful? Why you versus other people, right? So essentially, when, when we have a five-minute conversation, a five-minute interactive conversation like this versus stories, when you tell stories, a five-minute story might produce a, a one-time a one aha message. But if you're going back and forth asking questions, five minutes of a conversation can produce five aha messages. So, so let me tell you what an aha message is. I just gave you one. So here's an aha message. Five minutes of an interactive conversation can produce as many as five aha messages. So that would be an aha message. So what I do is I'll do the two-hour interview and I'll, I'll pull out of that. Uh, what we do is we'll take the two-hour interview, we'll match it up with one of the graduates from the AHA That Writing School, and they will write the manuscript. And the manuscript has 140 AHA messages, so we're pulling the genius out of your head. Um, it'll have 140 AHA messages and seven blog posts. And and so you, as the author, get get to read it. It's your, con it's your content. It's just formatted in a way that today's world wants to consume data. And what they want to consume they want to consume small, bite-sized snippets of content. We're giving you 140 of them. It's pretty cool. Hmm. Well, okay. And so you give this to your, like the facilitator, so you do the interview and take that information and distill it down to those 140 messages. And some you've got a team of people that does the kind of hard work at the typewriter or the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anyone has a typer anymore, but yes. No. <laughs> um, yeah. So we, we, what we'll do is we'll listen to the conversation. We'll generate back. Uh, like I said, the manuscript has 140 aha messages. And then once you do an update to that or approve that, and then what you do is you give us suggestions for what the book cover should look like. Every section, the content is broken into sections. Every section has an image in front of it. So, you take a look at the section uh, or give us suggestions for the section images, and then we will lay the book out in book laid out format, mm. right? So now you have something, and our books have 100 and, uh, 120 pages. 
And so when somebody sees the book, it has a very reasonable spine size. Yeah. And once you approve how the book looks in laid out format, we actually go to press and we will publish it in paperback and hardcover version, as well as PDF, Kindle. And and for those listening, I have a platform called Aha That, A-H-A-T-H-A-T dot com. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh Aha, that has over 750,000 users who are sharing people's content. Because in the Uh Aha, that platform, once your book is published, your 140 Uh Aha messages are added to now there's 47,000 Aha messages. And people go to Uh Aha, that.com. The platform is free to use, free to share. So people go to Uh Aha, that.com to share content on social media. Right. Right. And then then just to uh, finish it off, One of the things that I, uh, this year, one of the people who did lots of recommendations for me said, Mitchell, you know, what would really add value to your product? Like, uh, tell me. She goes, you need to actually do an Amazon bestseller campaign as part of your service. So what we do now is, is we will, we will also do an Amazon bestseller campaign. So, so when you ask me what I did, what I said is we, we empower people to, you know, individuals, you know, experts, thought leaders, companies to share their genius, we will give you a Amazon best-selling book, paperback, hardcover, all different ebook formats. We also have a auto audio version. Uh, so we'll put it on Audible and uh, yeah. 20 other 22 other places that sell audiobooks. Mm. And we run the Amazon bestseller campaign, which is really powerful. And in essence, you're going to spend as the author somewhere between five to 10 hours what I'm going to be doing is saving you 310 hours. Mm. If you actually took the time to write your book and publish it yourself, you'll spend about 120 hours writing. Uh, we save you about 200 hours on publishing. So another way to think about it, Michael, I'm selling you time, which you can't buy in today's world. Yeah. So for the price you pay me, you're giving me five to 10 hours of time, and I'm giving you 310 hours of your life back. And as an entrepreneur, what you have to say to yourself is, Two to four months down the road, I'm the author of an Amazon best-selling book, and I have 310 hours in my life that I didn't have before. How much money would I make if I was selling my business for 310 hours as an Amazon best-selling author? And that's the story that I tell. Right, got you. Yeah. I get it. It's it's unique. I've not heard anybody do this. This is This is – do you know other people that do what you're doing? Well, there are – so the, the short answer, and particularly when you're in Silicon Valley, you can never say, I do not have any competitors. No, of course not. Right? Because I, I do have one, the biggest competitor is the people who do it themselves. Mm, and, and by the way, if you're an entrepreneur and your business is not writing, if you do it yourself, I would say you're a entrepreneur, not really an entrepreneur. Mm. Right? Because if you're in business yourself, you have one job. You need to sell and market your business. Period. <laughs> mm-hmm. And if writing is not directly producing revenue for you, you are not selling and marketing your business. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so I have one competitor. The biggest one is to do it yourself. And there are many people who do ghostwriting. Mm. Uh, there are many people who do different forms of social media and blog advertising. So sure. you could always say there are many people who do similar things. What I could say with the strategy and go to market approach that we have at the moment. It would cost typically four to ten times what we charge for uh, for to try to cobble together some of the services that are on the market today. Yeah, yeah. Wow it 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 does sound like an incredible offer. And what? So now the question is: So if you're starting out in business, would you recommend that people? do something like this to begin with? Or should they do that a little bit further down the road after they've had, you know, a few few years of walking the pavement? You know, that's a great, it, it's a great question because there's a couple of things that are necessary, right? In order for me to extract your genius in two hours, you need to actually have been a practitioner solving a problem for your clients. Mm. Right. So if you have no clients and it's only theoretical, it may not be a uh, it, it, it won't be as valuable as after you have some real good lessons doing it yourself. 
Okay. So that would be one thing. Second thing is money. And that is, you know, when you've started business, there are just things you need to do. And you just have to, if money is not an object and you've already uh, have some clients in the door, yeah, there's no better catalyst to show people you're an expert or what you do than a book. Mm. Now, we'll still step back for a second. If all you did is create a book and you did nothing in terms of telling people you wrote a book and putting it in the hands of your prospects, that's not going to help you either. No. Right? There's there's no uh, there's no real panacea in life. I mean, I wish I I've got sitting on my desk an easy button and I wish writing a book by itself was pressing the easy button, uh, <laughs> but it's it's writing a book is the easy button of giving you the credibility. But let's say you spent 300,000 and you got a PhD and, and there's a company that wants to hire a PhD. So you say, Hey, can I get a job? But you don't tell them you're a PhD. Well, that, then if you don't tell them, it's not going to help. Mm. <laughs> right. Mm. So uh, one of the things I've been doing this last quarter, which has been so much fun is because my, my proposition, the value that I'm giving is so powerful and easy to explain. Um, customer acquisition is relatively easy for me. So what I've been doing this last quarter is partner acquisition. And, and what I mean by that is a go-to-market strategy where I say, hey, listen, you'll be an Amazon best-selling book and. And the and is I'll, next year I'll come to market with, with 12 different ands. So I, there's a person I work with who guarantees that she'll that you'll be a professional speaker making 150 thousand or more. She guarantees it. So mm -hmm. if she accepts you as a client, you're going to make 150 thousand. So so that'll be a package. Um, I've got a guy who uses LinkedIn to drive calendar appointments. I have two other people who use Facebook to drive calendar appointments. Um, I've got somebody who creates masterminds and have a service. Um, so I have two different agencies I'm going to be using. So what I'm going to be going to market with, remember I said we do business with those you know, like, and trust. I'm going to go to market with people who I actually trust and I truly believe will add value to clients. So if they really want to press the easy button, it will be the book and some service that will drive client acquisition. Because that, to me, is, I think, what's really valuable. That's right. It's absolutely fascinating. And I, and I know you've got other appointments lined up within a few minutes or seconds uh, even. Unfortunately, I'm happy to come back and chat again if you want. We could chat about your business. That'd be kind of fun. <laughs> yes. But I, I wanted to get out the essence of what you do, and you definitely have given me that. So that's wonderful. And I'd, I'd love your story and evolution and how that all came about as well. So, and I know I've, I've got a a ton of links to put in the show notes, but would you like to just give us like the top links that people can find more out about? Oh, sure. Ab absolutely. I, I, uh, here's the thing. Listen, if, if, if you guys are listening and you want to share content on social media, just go to aha that a h a t h a t dot com. And we've got 47,000 aha messages you can share, and it's free to use. Brilliant. If you're curious about either writing your book and having us write a book for you, um, you'll see it on the on the Aha That website, or you can go directly to ahathat.com slash author and see that. And then for those people who just like listening uh, to, to audiobooks, what we've done is some of our authors have, we just, uh, we rolled out this product, I think two months ago, somewhere between two to three months ago, we rolled out a product, it's called AHA That Radio. So if you went to AHA That, A-H-A-T-H-A-T -A -A radio.com, uh, it, 24 hours a day, we stream our authors reading their, their audiobooks. Mm -hmm. And the audiobooks are a half hour, half hour to listen to, and it's 140 AHA messages. And so essentially we delivering aha messages 24 hours a day for those that are interested it is it is so cool and, and for those who want to, if you want to reach out to me just google my name mitchell levy connect to me on the social media platform that's relevant for you yeah it's linkedin facebook twitter instagram google plus snap you know what the place you play is the place that i want to communicate to you on brilliant mitchell thank you so much for your time I was going to say pleasure. have fun, but it sounds like you're having fun anyway. So just keep doing the great stuff you're doing. You know, it, it, 
isn't it cool if you could actually say to somebody, keep having fun? Yes. And I'll say same same to you, Michael. Keep Thank having fun. Thank you so much, Mitchell. I'll be in touch. You're welcome. I look forward to it. Take Bye care. Bye now. Bye now. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 